And tonight's headlines include Kiwi exporters feeling the pain as the New Zealand dollar soars towards a record high. Beaconsfield Mine rescuers reveal they broke safety rules to save the lives of their trapped colleagues. A ruling by Australia's census has made it easier to distribute videos of race hate sermons here in New Zealand. And the America's Cup begins in earnest later tonight when Team New Zealand sails into the first race. We'll go live to Valencia for the countdown in tonight at 10.40. This one you found on the internet reveals valuable clues about a missing student on TV One. Tonight, a family fishing tragedy, two children drown in a sudden sinking in Auckland's Hauraki Gulf. From the prayers Thousands of, those... of New Zealanders remember on Anzac Day and pay tribute to the ones who never came home. The Anzac spirit prevails at Gallipoli. Kiwis and Aussies make the annual pilgrimage to pay their respects. And crashing out of the World Cup and the captaincy, Stephen Fleming retires as Black Cap skipper. Kia ora, good evening. An Anzac Day fishing tragedy has ended in tragedy for an Auckland couple whose son and daughter have drowned. They were all out fishing early this morning when their boat began to quickly sink, giving the children little chance of surviving. On a clear day, the chilling sight of the bodies of two young children being brought in from the sea. It's pretty hard to prepare for something like that, you know, your boat just sinking from underneath your feet. The tragedy happened right here, just off Tarahiki Island. Five-year-old Travis Rolls and his eight-year-old sister Erina were asleep on an eight-metre boat. Their mum and dad and two others were on deck fishing. The vessel started to sink at the back of the boat and the the driver of the boat attempted to drive it up onto the rocks to save it from sinking and uh, it sunk prior to him getting there. In pitch black, the adults swam for the rocks. Then they made repeated attempts to dive down to the children who were trapped inside. The boat has sunk, trapping um, two young members of the family inside it. This tragedy happened at two o'clock this morning, but in perfect conditions just like these. So how did it happen? The police don't know the answer to that yet. Um, we're still speaking with uh, the adults that were on board. Um, clearly they're in a, a state of shock. It's uh, been a tragedy to say the very least. The survivors were brought to this yacht club where the children's mother was treated and taken to hospital. I really felt for the mum and the rest of the family. It's very sad, very sad. Three men, including the father, were unharmed but frozen to the bone and in shock. The family had only just bought the boat. It now lies somewhere out there waiting to be salvaged so police can find out how this horrible accident happened. Tony Reid, One News. And police have launched a separate investigation after finding a woman's body close to where they recovered the bodies of the children. It's not known who she is and police are asking anyone with information to come forward. Sir Edmund Hillary is said to be recovering well from a suspected fall and is expected to be out of hospital in a few days. These pictures of Sir Ed were taken during his trip to Nepal last week. On his return home, he was admitted to hospital. His wife, Lady Hillary, says he's improving daily and there's no reason for undue concern. Thousands turned out for Anzac Day, but the commemorations have been marred by a protest in Wellington. Good weather across most of the country meant morning services were well attended. No matter where you hear it, it always has the same meaning. The last post rang out across the country as New Zealanders turned out to remember. We will remember them. Auckland Cenotaph hosted 15,000. Under the dawn Justice. sky, both young and old the gathered to pay their respects. I remember a lot of those people that were with me and are here now. The birds joined in with the band at Hastings Civic Square. But in the Garden City, it was a much noisier affair. A round of volleys shattered the stillness of a balmy Christchurch morning for its 7,000 strong crowd. Further south, Dunedin had its biggest Anzac turnout in recent years. And even though Bluff was one of the only places in the country where it rained, the parade still went on. 
protesters interrupted Wellington's dawn service. Two people were arrested and charged with offensive behaviour after burning a flag and yelling insults at veterans. I thought that was um, incredibly disrespectful. I just thought it sounded really terrible. I was ashamed, really. Hayley Westenra was centre stage, but the crowds were there to pay their respects. Oh, just to remember the Antics, I'm glad we're all free today. It's just something that you need to do, I think, as a New Zealander. The soldiers that fought in the war that made it um, a free country. Throughout the country, veterans marched to applause as they left Anzac services. <laughs> Time is not wearying them. The number turning out to remember those who fought for us is growing each year. Beth Roach, One News. While New Zealanders were paying their respects around the country, half a world away, thousands had gathered at Anzac Cove in Turkey. The Gallipoli campaign of 1915 marked a disastrous military defeat, but it's come to represent an important symbol of our national identity. Our Europe correspondent Melissa Stokes is there. Melissa, you've covered the Gallipoli commemorations last year. How has the build-up been this time? Well, Wendy, the build-up to this event is really quite muted. Well, it's probably one of the biggest uh, influx of people into Turkey. It all happens extremely quickly. Business owners around the villages of Gallipoli Peninsula lament that now most tourists are coming in on package tours. They're whipped in and out of the cove within 24 hours. They come in, they take a tour of the battlefield, and then they come here to this very sacred site for the dawn service. As the light lifted over Anzac Cove, thousands stood where many have fallen. They shall not grow old as we who are left grow old. They came in their masses with no shortage of reverence for those who put their country first. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. More than 2,700 New Zealand soldiers died on the Gallipoli Peninsula. Up to 13,000 people have braved chilly conditions to remember their efforts. It's quite um, a serious experience. Everyone's here, no one's here for a party. We're just all here to pay respect to those people who believed enough in New Zealand to die for it here. It's a sacred site for Aussies and New Zealanders, many travelling to the cove on a personal journey. For James Johnson, it was to remember his great-grandfather. He was, he was one of the lucky ones. Most of his regiment died and um, he was lucky enough to just get wounded and be evacuated. Others say it's part of our national pride. I think it's kind of a rite of passage for a lot of New Zealanders um, in terms of their respect for New Zealand and just what they believe in and for their country. And the battle here has become part of our identity. The bravery of our soldiers and the losses they suffered here 92 years ago remain seared into our history books and archives and into our national psyche. One in four New Zealand soldiers died on these shores and today as dawn broke, their descendants and fellow Kiwis did their best to keep their memory alive. Well, Melissa, both our governments and Australia issued a terrorism alerts this year, but those fears don't appear to have come to anything at this stage. Has the security been obvious to you? It's been very obvious here at the Cove, Wendy. From when you start and come down that road to the Cove, you go through a, um, a series of security points. And then when you get to the Cove, there was a patrol boat out in the waters there. You have to go through the baggage checks and come here. There were no problems that we saw, uh, and everything seemed to go very smoothly. The Turkish officials take the safety of their visitors very seriously. And I'd say that most and the bulk of the people here were blissfully unaware of the security threat. Melissa Stokes, thanks. Live from Anzac Cove. We turn now to Australia, where around 150,000 people lined city streets to pay their respects today. Many of them have now retired to the pubs and clubs, and our correspondent Garth Bray is at one of them, the RSL in Chatswood. A significant spot for the Kiwi contingent too, Garth. That's right, Simon. Uh, not just because there's beer and uh, a regimental brass band about to start up any minute now. Uh, this is also the official home away from home for all New Zealand servicemen and ex-servicemen if they're here in New South Wales. There are about 40 or 50 permanent members 
and a number of others are upstairs, friends and family and so on, just uh, soaking up the ambiance, if you like. They need, they need the rest because uh, they marched along with about 22,000 others up George Street today. Uh, it was a, a fairly solemn occasion, obviously, the rain, uh, but uh, plenty of cheering crowds to, uh, to push them on. And of course, while most were respectful and solemn, that's uh, not been the case all over Australia, one part in particular. No, Simon, a rather disturbing story from Bathurst in the centre of the state where uh, people going to the dawn service this morning are heading that way. Uh, a few hours before that found uh, a group of teenage girls had daubed a number of slogans across the town war memorial, um, describing Anzacs as murderers and, uh, and suggesting that Australia shouldn't be involved in any wars. Uh, I understand police and others uh, spent perhaps several hours uh, trying to remove those slogans before the dawn service and uh, there are four young uh, women uh, receiving some counselling uh, and, uh, and one 16-year-old woman who's been charged with malicious damage as a result of that. So you could fairly say, though, that the town of Bathurst is shocked at their protest. Thanks for that, Garth. Garth Bray, live from Sydney. Anzac commemorations got off to an embarrassing start for the army in Auckland. A Unimog truck towing a gun to the dawn parade collided with a van. The driver of the second vehicle has a broken leg and was taken to Auckland Hospital. Police are still investigating the accident. There's a push to keep alive the memory of one of our bravest group of war heroes, the men of the 28th Māori Battalion. As their numbers dwindle, the families of the soldiers are asking the government to recognise their children. Wikitoria Wright's war memories date back to the 1861 New Zealand Wars. My father-in-law, who is Pākehā, um, wanting a better uh, life for all New Zealanders. And I guess it was the same with my husband. A treasure trove of war memories she wants preserved. My own right as a widow that the two eights be formed as a, a memorial trust and uh, so that the name will, will never be lost and the children of the two eight will be able to carry that name on. A 1964 Veterans Constitution says the legacy of the 28th Battalion ends with the last man. But their widows want their children to be able to represent their fathers. There's no talk about uh, the children being uh, part of the, the association. The government is backing their cause. Clearly, um, the old soldiers are uh, clear in their mind of how they want to wrap it up, and time will help that along, but I certainly do support um, the widows. It's a task she's determined to pursue, determination matched by her late husband. Excuse me. When you see them now and um, see how old they are, and uh, they're suffering with wounds. I guess I was lucky my husband never went through that. He just um, collapsed while addressing his, um, his iwi at a, at a hui, a kauhanga nui hui. Wikitoria is determined to keep the memories alive. I still think of him as, um, as my Casanova. Tinny Molyneux, One News. Well, coming up after the break, an unlikely gathering is national and the Greens discuss the controversial anti-snacking bill. Why filling up at the pump is about to cost you more. And he bet on his own life a big birthday payout for the 100-year-old who beat the bookies. What does it mean to be Irish? You get to sing and dance and drink and everything's somebody else's fault. Teresa Healy travels New Zealand to discover... How much of what we now call Kiwi comes from those Irish roots? There'll be rugby greats, split ends, booze... Uncomfortable just drinking continuously. ...and Catholic schoolgirls. It's true what they say about convent girls. Forbidden fruit's always the sweetest. We went wild! They must have populated half the world by now. <laughs> Here to stay, Monday, 7.30, TV1. As the country commemorates those who never came back from far off battlefields, we're in Vanuatu to revive the memory of two young Kiwi airmen who took off from this airstrip only to be lost in dense jungle 63 years ago. That's close up tonight at 7. The high cost of petrol may not be enough to put off the government from hiking petrol taxes. Auckland's facing an increase of up to 10 cents a litre to fund key regional projects. If there's one thing Aucklanders can agree on, it's petrol prices. It's just incredible how much it's gone up. Bloody awful. I think we're paying plenty already. But a pre-budget rumour of a 10 cent a litre price hike has been given legs by the government's allies today. The Green Party uh, supports a 10 cent uh, regional tax on petrol, but we'd like to see it all going towards uh, public transport. Several regional projects could benefit from an extra tax, including the Western Ring Route and additions to the Northern Motorway. 
But the regional council, like the Greens, says it would support a levy only for public transport, not roads. It would be willing to support a modest regional fuel tax um, to help fund the electrification of the Auckland railway network. The sort of increase the ARC envisages is more like five cents a litre, but even that would be a bitter pill for drivers dealing with pump prices unthinkable just a few years ago when a one dollar litre was threatening. But with an acknowledged need for improvements to public transport and unfinished roading projects first slated decades ago, the money has to come from somewhere. A main alternative to increased petrol taxes is the use of toll roads. But that's another subject that gets an angry reaction from Aucklanders. No, I don't, I wouldn't be happy paying that. The people on the bottom of the heap are just going to pay and pay and pay and pay. National's not ruling out support for the idea. If the argument is that they're no longer applying tolls in Auckland and, and this is a proxy for tolls, then we'd have to have a look at that. But with pump prices already taking a toll, any intentional increase will be a tough sell to these drivers. Lisa Glass, One News. Trans-Tasman rivalry has been put aside in a ceremony in Auckland and not only because of Anzac Day. Tourism Australia has honoured New Zealand firefighters who fought bushfires in Australia. More than 100 Kiwi firefighters helped battle the wildfires across Victoria in I December and January. All of our neighbours. Um, we come from two great nations, but when incidents happen and we ask each other for help, we become one entity. The firemen received the Spirited Mateship Awards as part of this year's G'day New Zealand Australia Week. An unlikely political pair got together today to talk about the controversial anti-smacking bill. National leader John Key and Green MP Sue Bradford tried to reach a compromise over an issue that sparked bitter debate across the country. What you're about to see doesn't happen every day. Sue, how are you? Hi, John. Nice Welcome to, to the Green Party offices. Oh, thanks, I think nice for the here. first time. Yes, for the first time. <laughs> Great to be here. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good you could good. come. The meeting with John Key and Greens MP Sue Bradford was all a bit awkward as they made a small talk. But behind closed doors, he put to her an idea to amend the anti-smacking bill. So every parent of a child is justified in lightly smacking the child in the course of their parenting duties if the smacking used was minor and inconsequential. Like hell, say the Greens. It still contradicts the fundamental purpose of my bill in that it legitimises, in words, the use of some form of violence against kids. I'm um, actually deeply disappointed and frustrated. Uh, we came to the party's day with a genuine compromise. He says the amendment would simply put parents' minds at rest. That would have given New Zealand parents some confidence that they're not about to become criminals. They can now have no confidence if this bill passes. Sue Bradford says a light smack is just too difficult to define. You could say the meeting was an act of desperation on the part of John Key. One of his MPs has already tried to amend the bill, but failed. But all was not lost. John Key clearly loved the Anzac bookies on offer at the Greens. I was really hoping that um, there might be a way. So I'm sorry it hasn't worked. <laughs> And he vows his party will get stuck into the smacking debate again in the House next week. Right. Hannah Hodson, One News. A World War II Navy hero who grew up in Port Chalmers has been honoured by the Otago town. A hilltop lane now bears the name of Campbell Buchanan, who was fatally wounded during the sinking of a Japanese submarine at Guadalcanal. The attack led to the discovery of vital Japanese code books aboard the sub. What he did changed the course of the war. And, the, and I think that's wonderful to be recognised after 64 years. Campbell Buchanan's sisters won his 87-year-old twin unveiled a memorial plaque at the entrance to the lane. Today is, of course, the biggest day of the year for RSAs around the country, but many are closing as veterans pass on. The sudden closure of the Nainai RSA in the Hutt Valley two weeks ago has angered locals who say the timing so close to Anzac Day was off. <laughs> Flags raised to mark Anzac Day. But the colours weren't flying at the Nainai RSA in the Hutt Valley this morning. It's a sign of the times. Like many clubs around the country, it's the last post for Nainai. The club closed its doors a fortnight ago. Today I just wanted to come here even though it is closed. To remember not only my dad, but also everybody else that served for us. Some defiant club members claim the sudden shutdown just before Anzac Day is a disgrace. To be uh, shot out of our own 
club is, is uh, not good at all. We have no say. No one's, no one's got a say. Committee members rallied and the local workingmen's club offered to foot the bill for a final Anzac bash. They wanted to give a large spice to the old people. That's what I want. But the RSA shut down the plan. Instead, it posted notices promising members bus rides to other RSAs to commemorate Anzac Day. But empty buses this morning show people didn't jump on board with the idea. Half of them won't live till next year again. And this is the only time they have as Anzac Day to get together. And they've taken that away from them. But in true Anzac spirit, nearby Taita RSA has come to the party. Locked out Nine members were guests of honour today and ties may become even stronger for the two clubs. There's talk of amalgamation. It may not be last drinks for Nainai RSA yet. Shalene Hearn, One News. A day of mourning has dawned in Moscow for the man who helped dismantle the Soviet Union and bring democracy to Russia. Thousands have paid their respects to former President Boris Yeltsin. The 76-year-old died of heart failure. He'll be buried with full state honours later tonight. <laughs> Moscow's ornate Cathedral of Christ the Saviour, a setting fit for a czar, and to say goodbye to the first president Russians have ever had. Whatever they thought of him in life, his death marks the passing of an era, and thousands of them wanted to pay their respects. Also among the mourners, his grieving wife and two daughters, and enveloping the occasion, the trappings of the Russian church and state, Boris Yeltsin helped to restore to power. Outside, people stood in line from early afternoon. Some confessed they were just curious. Others were visibly upset. Muscovites, who remember Boris Yeltsin from his early days, before the disappointment set in, when he was still a political superstar. Natalia Volkova remembers the rocketing prices that meant she could barely afford a bar of soap. I voted for him because he got rid of communism, she said. Stanislav Vasiliev runs his own translation business and owns his own flat, all due to Yeltsin's reforms, he says. I adored him, basically. <laughs> he was young, he was energetic, he was speaking well. As dusk fell, the tributes from mourners hadn't abated. Defining Boris Yeltsin's place in history will come later. For now, Russia is simply saying farewell. The bet of a lifetime has paid off for a British man who's just celebrated his century. Ten years ago, Alec Holden bet £100 that he'd reach his 100th birthday. A bookmaker gave him odds of 250 to 1, and he's just collected more than $67,000. I felt as long as I was going to live forever. <laughs> Makers William Hill say in future they'll only take bets on people reaching 110. <laughs> Good on him. Well, still to come on One News, I was no Rambo. The American soldier hailed as a hero puts the record straight. I'm still confused as to why they chose to lie and try to make me a legend. Scathing testimony from Private Jessica Lynch. And from war to peace, the changing role of the Kiwi soldier. Tonight, close-up comes to you from here at Waikometi, the country's largest war cemetery. And we have stories for you from around the world, including the guardians of the Gallipoli graves, the Turks who tanned the Anzacs' final resting places, and the four-legged friends who went to war and never came back. Seven o'clock on one. The book was for my cousin Travis. He died and was buried on my 11th birthday. Which is why you called it... The saddest birthday ever. Hey, this is Fair Go. You know what happened. Fair Go. Tonight, TV One. Welcome back. Looking at our top stories now, police are investigating a boating tragedy in Auckland's Hauraki Gulf, which left two children dead. The five- and eight-year-old were trapped in a fishing boat that sunk. Four adults on the boat swam to safety. A separate investigation is also underway after a woman's body was found near the scene of the sinking. Anzac Day services around the country were well attended, with good weather ensuring thousands turned out for the commemorations. 
But there was a sour note in Wellington when two peace protesters burned the New Zealand flag at the dawn ceremony. Two people have been charged over the incident. And on the other side of the world, up to 13,000 people braved chilly conditions at Anzac Cove on the Gallipoli Peninsula in Turkey to remember the New Zealand soldiers who died there. The ceremony passed off peacefully, despite terrorism alerts earlier being issued. Battles in far-off countries are something very few New Zealand soldiers actually experience these days. Now most of their work is peacekeeping in countries much closer to home. More than 100,000 Kiwis served in World War I, a tenth of our population. 16,500 of them were killed in action, the highest death rate per capita of any other country. It was prevalent in World War I and World War II, where military forces were seen very much as purely a war-fighting organisation. Back then, it was about numbers on the ground. Once again, the need arises and the second New Zealand Expeditionary Force is in again. For Another 150,000 Kiwis fought alongside the Allies in the Second World War. Nearly 12,000 killed this time. And that's what you did. You applied the maximum amount of force to achieve your, or, uh, achieve your objective. Malaysia followed, Korea, Vietnam. Southeast Asia has become a special concern to New Zealand. But war has changed. So have our troops. Today we have around 14,000 men and women in the Defence Force. Their role is not on the battlefield. They're there to keep the peace, rebuild infrastructure, help restore daily life. Any military force, or any New Zealand military forces of course, change over time to reflect the needs of the period. Soldiers say those signing up today haven't changed from the men who fought all those years ago. They share the same values that we aim to um, perfect these days. That of camaraderie, mateship, courage, um, integrity, that we, again, soldiers of today need to master. And to master it would take frontline involvement in major warfare. If I was to deploy tomorrow, I'd have no problems with it. Juliet McVeigh, One News. The female US soldier portrayed as an all-American hero after being dramatically rescued in Iraq has shot down the government's version of her story. Private Jessica Lynch was supposedly shot, stabbed and tortured before being saved. Made good headlines, but the reality was rather different. Iraq, April 2003. A dramatic nighttime rescue by US Special Forces. They've surrounded an Iraqi hospital and saved a young American soldier with terrible injuries. A woman, 19-year-old Jessica Lynch. Private Lynch had been wounded and captured when her convoy was ambushed. The official story had her firing her rifle till she ran out of ammunition as her friends died around her. She came home to rural West Virginia a hero. America loved her, and saving Private Lynch was a terrific, inspiring war story from a war that would divide America. But today, in Congress, Jessica Lynch repeated that that official story was simply not true. In the ambush, she said she had cowered in her vehicle and prayed. It was understaged by media, all repeating the story of the little girl Rambo from the hills of West Virginia who went down fighting. It was not true. I have repeatedly said when asked that if the stories about me helped inspire our troops and rally a nation, then perhaps there was some good. However, I'm still confused as to why they chose to lie and try to make me a legend when the real heroes of my fellow soldiers that day were legendary. I have answered Congress this. now wants to know how and why the American military has been spinning the harrowing tales of ordinary soldiers into tall tales of heroism. Jessica Lynch is now a mother back in West Virginia. She says she only wanted to tell the truth, but her story asks difficult questions of the American military and how it's presented itself in this war. Well, sport now with Neil and Stephen Fleming. He's stepping down. Yes, he has as captain of the One Day Internationals. Mm -hmm. We hear from Stephen Fleming shortly and see how his counterpart dismantled the Black Cats. Can he bring up his hundred? There it is. And what a way to bring it up with a four backward of point. A clenched fist from Jai Warden and he recognises the importance of the game. Cometh the hour, cometh the Sri Lankan captain. Jane, the Black Caps couldn't find the same sort of form. I threw him. Ah! It's close. It's real close, yeah. But in Valencia, Team New Zealand show how to climb out of trouble. 
and find out how All Black Keith Robinson earns his hard man tag. Your choice tonight, TV One. She was evil personified. The unknown story of history's most notorious child killer. Real crime, Myra Hindley. Over on two. What? Tell him this! Watch out! Oh, no. Scum of the earth! Right. Ah! The, the medical board suspended your license. This is a felony punishable by imprisonment, doctor. The verdict is in. Real crime on TV1, ER on TV2. Your choice tonight on TVNZ. Welcome back. New Zealand's dismal semi-final record at the Cricket World Cup has continued with a crushing defeat to Sri Lanka this morning. Five times the Black Caps have made the semis and five times they've lost. Today's defeat prompting Stephen Fleming to quit as one-day captain, saying fresh ideas and enthusiasm is needed. Deflated, defeated. The Black Caps choking with the world at their fingertips. As usual, much hinged on Shane Bond, but he hadn't played for ten days. This is the second boundary in the over and a poor start for Bond. Nine from his first over meant James Franklin had to front. Bowl him! <laughs> Soft. He had the match really even soft. Stevens at one stage, but it's stylish good. opener Upal Taranga was still there. He That's stroked 73 off 74 before Daniel Vittori struck. <laughs> Bowl him round his legs! But no inroads followed for the Black Caps. Instead, it sparked Sri Lankan skipper Mahela Jaya Wardner into life. Straight down the ground for six. A magnificent stroke. Brilliant shot. Quite brilliant. Jaya Wardner's ninth one-day century. More remarkable because just 17 came from his first 47 balls. He ended unbeaten on 115 from 109. The platform for Sri Lanka's total of 289 for five. The chase was always going to be difficult. Right through him, big shot, and here comes a slow left hand. Fleming wasn't the only one to struggle with Lasith Malinga. At one stage, Ross Taylor was beaten five deliveries in a row before finally getting bat on board. Ross Taylor loved every bit of that. <laughs> but his patience had been tested. It's close. It's real close, yeah. Continue Scott Styrus and Peter Fulton gave some hope. Lovely. 73 at a runner ball had the Black Caps back in it. But just when Styrus needed to kick on... Yeah. And there's one. Styrus gone for 37. Then four wickets fell in the space of 12 balls for just two runs. Has he caught it? He has. Oh, it's all going wrong for New Zealand. Only 59 from the last pair, James Franklin and Jeetan Patel, provided a hint of respectability. All out for 208, 81 runs short. The loss confirming its first casualty. Glenn Lama, One News. This game is captain. Um, I still want to captain the test side. I think if I'm available to captain the test side. Um, and I want to play, I'm only just turned 34, I think I've still got some good batting years ahead of me. Obviously dream the dream that I'd be lifting the cup and, and then saying thanks very much, but it's not not to be, um, but we've got to improve. We've got to make sure that the semi-finals is only the, the line in the sand. We've got to produce players with the calibre to take us to, to a World Cup final and win it. And we'd hope that we're going to have a couple of great days and, uh, and get there this time. We're just going to have to wait. We built up for this final. Um, this was a very big hurdle for us to jump and uh, get in there with stuff, but we're there now. And we've been preparing for that day for quite some time, so we'll be definitely be ready for that. Do you have a preference of which team to beat? No, I mean, if you're to win a World Cup, you have to be the best, and uh, um, obviously it's going to be a tough game tomorrow. Whoever comes through, quite happy to play that. South Africa and Australia meet in the other semi overnight to decide who will meet Sri Lanka in the final. Australia, of course, gunning for its third successive World Cup, and they'll again be looking to the tournament's top run scorer to lead the way. Same routine, different location. Matthew Hayden rehearses in St Lucia, a run machine right across the Caribbean. He's been the tournament's top scorer so far, totalling 580. A record fourth World Cup century could clinch Australia <laughs> a berth in the final. Um, I think just today is all about just trying to, like you say, just get a little bit of a feel for the ground. It's certainly um, mm. one of the best surfaces that we've seen throughout the tournament. During Australia's undefeated run this tournament, Hayden hit 100 against South Africa from just 66 balls, a World Cup record. This rivalry carries plenty of cup history. The famous 1999 semi-final finished in a tie. Australia advancing to the final on superior run rate. I hope it doesn't happen, but, well, 
I hope it does happen. <laughs> Smith has a slow mending knee injury, but it won't keep him out of a semi-final. Uh, it hasn't uh, healed as quickly as what I was hoping, but uh, I'm still pretty confident of getting onto the field. Well, the Australians are well aware all their hard work could be undone with just one sudden death semi-final. For their supporters, it's been anything but hard yakka. There'll be plenty of mudslinging before and during the match, but sudden death means one country will slide out of contention. Team New Zealand has fended off another potential upset in the Louis Vuitton Cup. But Kiwi satisfaction would have been short-lived as a new semi-final contender emerged in the biggest surprise of the regatta so far. Team New Zealand had already disposed of the French Arriva challenge as expected, but heading into the start box against Desafio Espanyol, they faced an entirely different proposition. The fired-up Spanish were coming off a victory against Mascarzoni Latino, who tipped over the Kiwis in their first race. This time, though, tactician Terry Hutchinson had a plan. Dean Barker was told he had to take the right, and he did. ...advantage to Spain. New Zealand have the power of the right. As is so often the case, the power was in the right, and Team New Zealand repulsed every Spanish attack before covering carefully for a 1 minute 12 second win. We do have a plan A and a plan B but we're, we're very clear we wanted that plan A and, uh, and Dean got it. We learned the hard way on the first day, some of the other teams learned today that everybody's really good and so you're going to have to say how good races to win. The big upset of the day saw Luna Rossa fall victim to the South Africans who showed their form against BMW Oracle Racing was no fluke. This time, though, the Xochelosa crew held their nerve and their lead over the top of the table team to pull off an historic win. One theory now is that Team New Zealand's first up loss to the Latin Rascals may have been a beneficial wake-up call. The Kiwis are on their game now, and they need to be. Next up, the giant killing Shoshaloza. Matitaska, One News, Valencia. Chiefs and All Blacks lock Keith Robinson will line up against the Waratahs on Friday night, his fifth start in a row in the Super 14. After a couple of years of inconsistent appearances, he's back on a roll. But is Robinson's body ready for the huge test season ahead? Pushing himself hard in his sanctuary away from rugby. Two years ago, facing life out of the game, Keith Robinson went into business, starting up his own gym at the foot of Mount Te Araha. There were days you know, when I honestly thought, I, I told friends and family that I was going to be chucking it in, and then you'd wake up in the morning and um, you'd be you'd come in here and have a workout, and you'd feel pretty good, and then, oh, shit, what was I thinking? And then, so it was ups and downs, all right. In 2005, he tried everything to get his body right. Surgery, acupuncture, even spiritual healing. The All Blacks hard man turning to Pilates. Back before I was injured, you, you look at Pilates and you think, oh, Christ, it's, it's not my... It's, What's that going to do? But um, I think you only realise how important it is after you've had an injury like I had and realise that the muscles um, in the middle of the body actually um, play a huge role. They're probably the most important muscles in your body. On Friday night, he'll play his fifth game in a row, his heaviest workload in the past couple of years. I think we found in the New Zealand Cup last year that uh, it's not so much the games that were, um, were taking the toll, it was the training early in the week and then playing the games continuously sort of took a toll on me, so we've sort of, um, I just train later in the week now, uh, get a bit of shit for that from the boys. Rob is a great footballer, and he does his job. He doesn't do a lot extra, but he does his job very, very well. Well enough to be a key World Cup figure. His gym's going great guns, but work with the Chiefs and All Blacks beckons first. Andrew Savile, One News. Wayne Rooney stole the show as Manchester United narrowly won the first leg of their Champions League semi-final against Milan. In a thrilling match, the Brazilian Kaká overturned an early Ronaldo goal with two superb solo efforts. Into the area, what a wonderful goal that was! Better movement here from United, Rooney, Wayne Rooney, but United and their way back to Rooney. have to touch it in because Rooney has equalised. And Giggs feeds Rooney. The Rooney coming in stoppage time. The, look at how much space there is there. Taking a 3 2 lead to I the mean, second leg next goal. Thursday. It's a really well worked goal. The NRL is once again dealing with a player with a drink problem. The Titans' Chris Walker has kept his job and the club has rallied around the troubled sta state of origin star as he tries to save his career. Chris Walker's career remains alive, but it comes with conditions. He's to undergo constant counselling and needs to work with a mentor. Walker will play reserve grade for eight weeks and has been fined 25% of his one-year contract. We acknowledge we do have a duty of care to the player. 
uh, and it's uh, our club's intention to assist Chris in the best possible manner around uh, receiving the best possible psychological care. Meanwhile at Cronulla, coach Ricky Stewart and Bridge Kamali have had a stormy past, but now they're shiny, happy people. The difference this year is, you know, I'm excited every day to come here. It's like, well, what am I going to learn today? You know, what's Ricky going to, you know, coach us or, or teach us today? Things weren't so friendly after that pass in Origin 1, 2005. Stewart was coach and Kamali lost his spot. Then Stewart got the job at the Sharks. I was on holidays and the speculation when he came that, uh, that I wasn't wanted sort of grew every day. It proved wrong and the halfback stayed. Now Stuart wants to see him back in origin. His attitude and his leadership off the footy field has been, I think, replicated on the field the way he's playing. Their task now, though, to steer the Sharks. Ginny May Coffin, One News. The NRL's traditional Anzac Day match is between salad dwellers, roosters and dragons. Both sides are coming off a bye and it showed early with plenty of errors, but the roosters came good with two quick tries. Nasty this time, we'll put it a long way in the air. Oh, put a tape on his back, fellas. He must be wearing his undies on the outside. The roosters on target for their 1,000th win. Formerly a winger, getting... It's always been a challenge for top amateur golfers to make the leap to the pros. Now a fourth tournament has been added to the Golf Tour of New Zealand to assist Kiwis chasing their dream. James Gill is one of New Zealand's top amateurs looking to turn pro. He knows it's a big gap to bridge. Some of the amateur events you, know, you play average and still finish top five, top ten. As opposed to in these, you know, you have to play a lot better to finish higher up on the leaderboard. Now, Greg Turner's Golf Tour of New Zealand has added another stepping stone, a fourth tournament to be played at Titirangi for young pros and amateurs. And if you're playing with pros, it's always going to help you make the transition from amateur to pro a lot easier. Greg Turner and his uh, colleagues are kind of bridging that gap here, giving these guys the opportunity, these young amateurs, our top amateurs, to play in, if you like, professional tournaments. It's a fantastic idea. Budding pro Matt Holton agrees. It is very awesome because, like I said, you get to play against your mates and all the top pros, and the, and the costs are pretty low as well. The first of the series starts in Tauranga tomorrow. Adam Hollingworth, One News. And finally tonight, with 40 seasons starting for the kids this weekend, a reminder to keep an extra special eye on the little nippers at the games. At a university gridiron game, a player latching onto a touchdown pass collected a four-year-old boy as well as the ball. Young Caden Thomas sustained a large gash to his forehead that required 30 stitches. He later said the collision kind of hurt. And you see, he'll be a tough cookie tough after kid. this, though. Yeah, he's ready. Poor little guy. That hurt. Well, Mark's along with close-up in just a few minutes from the country's largest war cemetery. Tonight, we come to you from Waikameti Cemetery with stories from around the globe. A Pacific pilgrimage to unravel the mystery of two missing airmen, the team of Turks who tend the Gallipoli graves of our fallen Anzacs. And we remember our four-legged friends who went to war and didn't come home. That's in just a few minutes. What are they doing down here? The hardest thing... The family can't see this. ...is to tell the loved ones. Can we handle this one, boss? No, I got it. I got some bad news. Every victim... What happened that night? ...has a family. It's a straight-A student from the bird shooting down the hood. Tonight, TV One. He took to battle like a caged animal. Every family has its secrets. DNA was James's father. Remember how he got that black eye? My dad would never hurt my brother. Cold Case, tonight, 8.30, TV One. Hi everyone, kia ora, and a special hello to all of our Anzacs. Well, it was mostly fine around the country today for dawn parade, and even though it started chilly in places, it soon heated up. Let's see how warm it actually got, and well, not that warm really in Invercargill, only 10 degrees, a cloudy 13 in Dunedin and 14 in Oamaru. Alexandra and Hawkitika warmed to 17 degrees, 19 in Ashburton and Nelson, and 20 in Blenheim, Masterton, Napier and Hastings. Gisborne was our hotspot with 22 degrees, closely followed by Hamilton, Thames, Auckland, Whangarei, Paihia and Kaitaia with 21. Well, although it stayed mostly dry today, there was a lot of uh, scrappy cloud around, but the main cloud for us to look out for is this cloud here in the Tasman from a trough. And uh, here it is on our isobaric map with a few fronts in tow, and they're likely to bring rain to the west coast of the South Island. 
and there's another front here in the east and that carries some precipitation. Meanwhile, a uh, high maintains a ridge over the North Island and down here in the southwest with another high approaching. So all of this means a generally overcast day in the South Island with rain in western areas here and scattered rain in parts of Otago and Southland spreading to uh, much of the island during the afternoon. Showers become heavier and more persistent in the west north of the glaciers and winds are mainly light. North Island should be mostly fine with early fog in the usual inland places and uh, cloudy periods in the north and southwest with a few possible uh, showers possible up there in the north from the easterly flow. Winds are mainly light, but showers are expected to develop in Wellington at night. And best have the umbrella on standby tomorrow in southern areas, with showers looming in Queenstown, Alexandra and Invercargill, and later Timidu and Ashburton. Expecting frequent falls in Greymouth and Hawketika, and with not much wind, be one of those grey old days. Mainly cloudy in the northeast of the South Island, but late showers seep into Nelson. Uh, sunny in Masterton here, but cloudy at times in Carpety, Levin. Palmerston North, Whanganui and New Plymouth, however, not unpleasant with temperatures close to 20 degrees. Meanwhile, it's uh, fine and sunny for all of these areas, and you better wax up your boards in uh, Gisborne. There's a cranking south swell coming in, but one for experienced surfers only, I reckon. And a nor'easterly breezes and a few cloudy periods to Whangarei, and a great day for fishing in Tarong and Whakatane, little wind and lots of sun. The cloud that's currently over Dunedin is likely to stay there tomorrow morning with scattered rain and drizzle, turning to more showery in the afternoon as that cloud starts to break up. Expecting a cloudy day in Christchurch with rain developing towards evening, a gentle northerly breeze and a 15 degree high. Apart from areas of cloud, Wellington should be fine with northerly winds and a temperature close to 17 degrees with showers developing at night, maybe a few foggy patches in the morning in Hamilton. Otherwise fine with a gentle northerly wind and a 19 degree high. And might be some morning fog around Auckland too, then fine with light winds and a high of 21 degrees. Across the Tasman, fine weather over much of Australia, except for rain in Adelaide, drizzle in Hobart, and a few afternoon showers in Sydney. And over the tropics, we've unsettled skies with passing showers from most of the islands. However, it should stay dry in Niue and Tonga. Back home and ahead to Friday, and at this stage, rain or showers continue in the South Island there, but start to clear in Westland and Fiordland, and the North Island gets a few showers too. And on Saturday, we have a period of rain in the North Island here, uh, turning to showers, and rain and showers gradually clear for much of the South Island. Meanwhile, should be racing in Valencia tomorrow as a consistent nor'easterly breeze is predicted, ranging from 8 to 14 knots. And that's our weather, nothing too extreme. Hope you're able to enjoy it. Ka kite o popo, see you tomorrow. Thanks very much, Brendan, and that is One News this Anzac Day. And with more on Anzac Day, it's now time for Close Up and over to Mark. Good night. Good night. Close Up is brought to you by Public Trust, New Zealand's own trustee, helping protect your interests.